Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Anthony Ramirez, a uh, cloud engineer and consultant at Nebula Works. And today we're gonna to be talking about building modern so teams and software. So a little bit about myself. Um, I've been at Nebula Works for about four years now and been on about a dozen engagements with different clients, um, building custom automation scripts, tools, and software. Um, from the get-go, I've been leveraging cloud platforms, leveraging tools like Kubernetes, container virtualization, and agile and Kanban software development methodologies. Um, I enjoy skateboarding, riding my motorcycle, rock climbing, and reading books about leadership and technology. So this talk is for DevOps practitioners, software developers, software engineers, engineering managers. And if you're interested in how you can build cloud native applications, then I assume this talk is for you. This talk is about team building. I'm gonna keep this at a high level and some of the things I'm gonna be speaking about are gonna feel straightforward, but I think it's important to keep in mind for teams that are either trying to cultivate a culture of um, collaboration and transparency, or if you have Greenfield teams or initiatives in your organization, these are some things to keep in mind when you know grouping some new people together to solve problems with new technologies. And I'm going to talk about some software development methodologies that we use internally at Nebula Works. And the reason why I put this content together and I'm delivering this presentation is I think it's important to always have your team back. And sometimes when we're building technologies or software, it's easy to have a narrow scope of what we have to do. There's hard deadlines, there's granular tasks we gotta do. So I think it's important to sometimes take a step back and understand how we're working together with each other. Because we're building software, but it's people that are building software. So it's important to always understand that the way that we communicate with each other can be improved and to encourage a growth mindset in your organization and teams. So always keeping the end in mind, understanding that things can get better, and especially for leadership and management, to always empower their, um, their teams and coworkers in order for them to be successful at their jobs. So now I'm gonna start diving into the presentation. Taking flight. Engineering the future. So I had an anecdotal story here and it revolves around creating the first airplane. So in the late 19th century, there was a craze about building airplanes. Um, they had been gliders and other aeronautics and aerospace technologies being developed at the time, but there was a race to, the, to develop the first man-controlled powered airplane. And there's a couple of key players here that I'm gonna mention, Orville and Wilbur Wright and Samuel Pierpont Langley. These two parties wanted to develop technology that could change the world forever. In order to do that, they needed to test and build schemes and technologies with available resources, tooling, and social networks. And the end result would be to be the first team or engineers to build an airplane that was controlled by a person. So the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is to just kind of describe the resources that were available to these two different parties were much different. Um, Samuel Pierpont Langley was an assistant professor at Harvard. He was a mathematics professor. He was connected with some of the most um, established government officials of the time. He had access to major amounts of funding and he still could not achieve this goal of building an airplane. In contrast, we have Orville and Wilbur Wright who lived in a small town in Ohio. They owned their own bicycle shop and they were able to rally up their local community, all of the employees of their, their shop in order to make this dream a reality. So although these two parties were equipped with different resources, they both had great engineering minds. However, resources sometimes are not everything. Sometimes it's the belief system of the people that are doing something or building something that matters most. And in this case, Orville and Wilbur Wright 
were the underdogs. They had less resources, less connections, um, et cetera. And the reason I'm bringing this story up is that sometimes when you're trying to initiate change in your organization, or you're trying to make, um, you know, adopt new process or influence people around you, you may feel like the underdog. People might be resistant to, resistant to change. So even though you're the underdog, it's important to know that sometimes it's the belief system and how you inspire and lead others that makes the difference, that will push you over the edge. So going into the content that I'm gonna talk about, if you're trying to make change, or you're trying to kind of take new tips and tricks from this presentation to your own organization, just understand that it takes, it takes inspiring the people around you in order to, to make change um, and endure, make enduring change, really. And here's a, a picture of the Wright brothers taking flight in North Carolina in 1903, and the rest is history. So here we, here we are with uh, the start of the four principles, and the overarching vibe that I want to set here is that everyone is responsible. Um, in a team, whether it's a, a sports team, if you've worked with software development teams and engineering teams, um, you're building teams in other lines of business, sales, marketing. One key thing to keep in mind is that everyone's responsible and everyone's accountable. Every player on a team has a well-defined role and responsibilities. And in order for the team to be successful, everybody has to be doing their job at the best possible way that they can. So now I'm gonna jump into the first principle here. And just to provide some context, some of these things that I'm talking about are gleaned from about a dozen projects that I've been on. And I kind of recognize these things as, as kind of patterns that came up and things that we need to keep at the front of our minds when working with other people. So one of the main things that I saw was being able to maintain lines of communication. Communication is key and personal relationships, interpersonal you know, communication skills are essential when you're, when you're solving a hard problem. So here I have on the left, encourage and on the right, avoid. So this is gonna be a common pattern or co uh, the, the framework for the rest of the slides. So on the left, is a list of things that we want to encourage, and on the right is a list of things we want to avoid. Um, so we want to be able to leverage consistent tools. So uh, through all the projects I've been on, we've been working with various clients, and all organizations work differently. Internally, we leverage Slack, Zoom, and be able to pick up the phone and text each other. So one thing is that's important for our team is to leverage consistent tools for communication. So everybody knows exactly how to get a hold of each other. And when we have a new engagement, we add all the clients that are going to be working closely with the engineering team to a specific Slack workspace channel that we use to drop in either questions, uh, recordings that we have for demos. We add all appropriate individuals or key stakeholders from different lines of businesses to this channel in order for them to have insight into what's going on. So this encourages collaboration between the different lines of businesses. So sometimes we have just engineers, sometimes we have um, engineers, project managers, key stakeholders, all on the same channel in order to create transparency in what we're doing. Another thing is we want to reduce redundancy in meetings. So in the past, we had a meeting that was around uh, kind of status updates. So we have uh, these ongoing projects, and of course, we have daily standups. We have biweekly sprints. We have at, we leverage agile software development methodology. So we have standups for our projects already. However, internally, we had an additional meeting that was kind of a status update thing, and we also have what's called an engagement review board meeting. So this meeting, this standup meeting, was redundant. We didn't need it, but it existed because we had it in the past, and we kept doing it out of tradition. But in reality, we didn't really need it that much. So we removed that meeting and kind of focused all our attention on the engagement review board meeting. And I'll explain a little bit about that. This meeting, this engagement review board meeting was intended for the engineers. All the engineers get into the room. Um, they bring up problems that they have, any blockers, any strange errors that they're experiencing. 
And at this point, they have a platform in order to ask questions and for other engineers to share expertise. So this is important because it helps everybody be aware of what other people are working on and potentially can help other people solve problems. Another thing to do is establish feedback loops and meetings and code. So after any demo or um, project completion, we have post-mortem meetings. So we're able to huddle up and say, these are things that went well, these are things that didn't go so well for that project, for that demo, and provides us to have quick feedback on what we can do better as a team. And having these kind of recurring meetings and, and frequent feedback loops allow us to be more, it, it encourages us to express our concerns more openly versus not having these types of meetings or not having the ability to, to express my ideas or concerns. It's important to be able to give engineers um, different lines of businesses the platforms in order to speak their mind. Another thing I wanted to touch on here is feedback loops with code. So this is important when making any, any sort of change to a code base, there needs to be process in place in order to handle merge requests, pull requests, as well as having potentially CI systems when necessary um, or when relevant in order to provide rapid feedback to the developer when they need to test their code. So they push some code up and then a CI system integration with a GitHub or GitLab runs and then provides feedback back to the developer to say, hey, your code's broken, you need to come and fix this. So again, just to kind of recap here, we want to avoid creating structures that silo teams. So if there's any sort of silo that exists that you think um, you can you know, squash at your organization, sometimes it's as simple as getting a meeting going and getting the right people in the room. Another thing is adopting tools that abstract complexity. So this is um, another thing around um, kind of feedback loops with code. If there's some things that you're doing with CICD that is kind of really complex and doesn't really provide any sort of value to your engineering team, or there's communication tools that are kind of um, not, they're avoid, people avoid using them because they're too complicated, then, you know, avoid those things and leverage tools that do one thing and one thing well. And of course, you always want to encourage your team to express any concerns. Another thing we have that allows us to do that is one-on-one -on -one meetings with our CEO. So we can schedule a meeting with him, and then if you have any concerns that are happening throughout the organization, we can bring this up to him here. So it kind of, it's kind of this like cyclical uh, feedback loop where we have people that are uh, on the ground working on engineering work. If we have a concern, we bring it back, bubbles up to the CEO, and then the CEO can propagate change back down to the, the organization. Next one here is encourage leadership over management. I think one, one important aspect of building efficient teams is promoting autonomy. Um, when we give people the trust that they deserve, they will more, more than likely succeed and even excel at what they're doing. Um, one, one project that I have in mind is we were working with a large software organization and they had this culture from the get-go. It was a small team and they had access to multiple code bases that other teams had developed. And when we were working with them, we needed to build an automation framework to test about 2000 um, servers or virtual machines that were running um, console, which is a tool for service discovery that was supporting internal production services. So they were able to provide us with a bunch of different linting scripts, testing scripts, bash scripts, um, puppet manifests in order to bootstrap clusters, all this stuff you're able to grab for us without any sort of bureaucracy in the way. So autonomy is extremely important. Another thing to keep in mind is developing onboarding and upskilling paths. I think this is one of the things that sometimes leadership and management um, do not think about enough. And it's, it's important to understand that you're not gonna be the last one to touch the code base. In order to make sure that that either endeavor, that platform, that, that application you're building is gonna be successful in the long term, is figuring out what is necessary for our teams to know in order to, to make sure that this thing grows and evolves in uh, a predictable way and in a reliable way. So developing you know, training paths, understanding that it's important to have learning resources like Pluralsight, Udemy, Linux Academy, Cloud Academy. Having these resources available to your engineers helps them have an avenue to go learn something new. 
And if you provide them the, with the, these resources, it makes them accountable. They have the available resources to get their job done, so they can go out and be autonomous and have um, some accountability on their self-growth and their self-learning. Things to avoid are micromanagement um, and making decisions without feedback from various players and angles. I think one of the one of the, the major things that I've seen um, companies do that has affected their um, morale and even their budget is kind of purchasing a tool for the sake of purchasing a tool without getting feedback from other people around them. So they spend a lot of money on something. They spend a lot of money on support, and then they're at a they're at a position where they have to you know integrate this into their organization into their existing workstream without really talking to other players in their team. So without really getting feedback and understanding like what's the future of this, what's the vision for six months to a year from now, um, those are conversations that leadership should cultivate and have uh, at the forefront of their mind when they're trying to purchase a tool. Another thing for, for management and leadership here is to become comfortable. You always want to find ways to empower your engineers. You want to back them up. You want to make sure that they have the, the appropriate tools and resources, um, learning resources, or even the platforms in order to speak up, like I mentioned earlier, um, setting up the right meetings, um, encouraging them to, to provide constructive criticism, criticism back to the leadership and have the leadership propagate change back down. So this next one is a little bit more technical and it's about leveraging sandboxes for rapid development. And to provide some context, I'm talking about Greenfield initiatives. So Greenfield initiatives are things that you're trying to try out for the first time so if, you're a, um, if you have data centers, you're on-premise, you're leveraging VMware, hypervisors, let's say you're going to the cloud for the first time. How do you do that? So our take is to create a development or a sandbox environment that you can start testing stuff out in. Um, and you want to set up your teams in a, in a different way, potentially, than you have in the past. So you kind of put together this, this rock star team, and their challenge is to go uh, develop something in the cloud. Um, we would say that the best way to do this is with infrastructure as code, leveraging tools like Terraform or Pulumi, um, and you know, other tools in that vein or something like CloudFormation or ARM templates in Azure. The idea though is that you have the ability to version control these pieces of code and other people can use them in order to build out infrastructure in cloud platforms. So the way that we have our, ourselves set up internally with AWS is that every engineer has the ability to assume a role into AWS and they can build out whatever they want in order to test or iterate or experiment with it. And of course we have the ability to lock down what they can and what they cannot create. So this creates uh, self-service and it promotes self-service. So if they want to test it, if they want to experiment, go, go ahead, um, go break something, go, go try something new. If you're curious, go experiment. Um, this promotes autonomy as well, where teams don't have to wait for someone to go provision a VM. I've seen um, places where it takes two, three months to get one virtual machine to test, which, is, which can be avoided completely with cloud platforms, which almost provide you instantaneous access to compute resources, um, um, you know, storage resources, etc. So we want to avoid creating bureaucracy and structures for resources. And of course, I'm keeping this at a pretty high level here. But the idea is that if you can find methods in order to empower or enable your engineers to have access to resources without having to go through a chain of command, um, try to find ways that you can do that. Another thing to avoid is to go straight to production. This one almost seem, seems common sense, but um, I've seen in the past where we build a platform out, um, we leverage you know, a release engineering process, there's a branch of strategy, there's, there's very well-defined processes that help us create more reliable code and sometimes teams are like, we're going to circumvent the process and we're going to take what you build and go straight to production. So, you know, the point of having a, a sandbox and, and uh, uh, you know, testing environment is to have the ability to safely test stuff without affecting production. So having these discrete environments that should look very identical is, is important and a very common pattern in large um, IT enterprises is having things such as development, staging, integration, production, these different environments that have specific um, responsibilities. So, um, you know, integration or, or, or staging is intended for maybe further integration testing, UX testing, things like that. 
But the idea is that you have these environments with well-defined purposes that you need to test, you need to make sure everything's well, like, you know, everything works out well. And then follow a release engineering process to move code and infrastructure built in development through the subsequent stages. But we want to avoid going straight to production. Lock down your, your release engineering process, your, your branching strategy, lock that down and make sure it's solid in your development environment. And then when you get that going, everybody's on the same page, all the engineers understand what each other are doing, then uh, make an effort to move towards a production setting. Create transparency in workstreams. So this uh, slide is going to be around issue tracking, issue creation, practicing agile development methodologies, leveraging Kanban type um, tracking boards. And it's really important to be able to create transparency with the tools that you use and the, the methods that you implement when you're building something. So when you're building a young team, um, you're building a team for the first time, or you're starting a new project, um, leveraging new technologies or, or trying something new, if you're trailblazing and, and doing stuff that you know, your organization has never done before, it's really important to have well-defined goals. So everybody understands what they're expected to do, and there's no confusion or um, people are not over, being overworked or they're not being underutilized. So having well-defined roles is very important. Another thing here is, Whenever we start a project, we have a kickoff call where all the engineers get into the same room and we understand, we, tr we, we have a well-defined um, vision of what we're gonna build. We then take the big picture and then create these kind of high-level high buckets of, I guess you could call them phases or categories of what we'll be doing. So it's like provisioning infrastructure, there might be research, integration deployment, um, validation testing, documentation. Um, so there's these high level phases that exist in the project. And what we do is we create these buckets. Sometimes they're different. A lot of times you can reuse the same uh, model. We then create issues that are relevant for those phases in a very granular way. So the, the reason we do this is we want to be able to work independently on tasks and not be stepping on each other's toes. So creating independent granular tasks allows engineers to pull tasks from the work queue and work in parallel. But another thing I want to talk about is leveraging data and information tools that, are, that all parties can access. So internally, we leverage GitLab for documentation, um, for delivery process, for our branching strategy, release engineering strategy. Marketing has a repo that outlines how we develop content for content marketing, so like our blogs, the videos that we make and share with the community, all this stuff is documented and it can always be improved. So engineers or, or market the marketing department can make pull requests to that repo and update and enhance the quality of um, that document process documentation. And another cool thing about leveraging a source code management tool for this is that you can, you can granularly tweak who has access to make code uh, merge requests and stuff like that. Additionally, it allows people to voice their opinion. And if something needs to be improved, then that, that can happen. And everybody else on the team can see these like kind of real-time updates to what's happening to the company's uh, process and have a very clear understanding of what's changing, what's being improved. Um, and it also helps people participate in code reviews to make suggestions and so forth. So some stuff you want to avoid is limited communication. So um, maybe not having recurring meetings, not holding people accountable if they miss meetings. Um, don't board code. I kind of seen this in the past where people kind of build up these really, really big feature branches. And this is not the best way um, to do it. We encourage frequent commits, um, committing very, you know, pushing up code frequently because one, you might lose your code if you accidentally RM something in your terminal, um, or you might be working on something for two weeks and find that when you go make the merge request or pull request, that it's not actually what the team was looking for. So, you know, there's a lot of cycles burned there. So if you can commit code frequently, people understand what you're working on and they can give you suggestions and guidance more quickly. Another thing is, is to be afraid to speak up. So if there is people hoarding code, if there is like 
uh, uh, you know, code that's being developed that's on a different tangent, it's important to say, hey, you know, this, and, and this is why it's important to have a merge pull request process, giving engineers the ability to go make suggestions. So if you're ever a contributor to open source software, there's well-defined pull request requirements in order to make any changes. Um, another thing is to not do work that is untracked. Um, if at any point a new issue comes up or you need to create another piece of functionality, which is kind of maybe tangential to an existing issue, it's important to create an issue and put it in the backlog or reprioritize accordingly, but avoid working on stuff that's not tracked in the issue. The reason is, um, is Without people knowing what you're working on, that can be uh, it can you know be contentious potentially. Um, but but having a, a, a Kanban type board allows you to show what's in progress, what's been closed, what's in review, and what's coming up. So you know it's it's just important to have the ability to to understand that that it's important that people create other issues in order so other teammates can know this functionality is on the way, or if right now I can't work on it, but I know it needs to be done, maybe another engineer could pick it up. So again, on a high level, these are the four pieces of um, team building that I think are extremely important. So maintaining lens of communication, encouraging leadership over management, leveraging sandboxes for rapid development, and creating transparency in the workshop. So now I'm going to transition to um, speaking about some of the tooling and methods that we use internally at Nebitaworks. So we're partners with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, training partners, and um, we are very, um, we, we are open source advocates and kind of, kind of proud of the, our partnership with the CNCF. Um, the ability to use open source tools to solve problems, I think, is, is, is should be promoted within organizations more often versus purchasing something or, or feeling that they need to buy a tool. Um, there's a lot of great tools and the, the whole initiative of cloud native computing is, um, is overall a great idea for the community. It increases collaboration um, and things like Kubernetes came out of it, which is our, our container orchestration platform of choice. So we use Kubernetes to deploy multi-tier um, applications. Um, so Kubernetes, we've been using Kubernetes for a while now. Um, we used to hand roll everything out, but now with the advent of managed services and cloud platforms, it makes it really easy for teams to get bootstrapped and leveraging Kubernetes. Um, we're AWS partners, so obviously cloud has a lot of value. We leverage Azure, we, lever we leverage Google, Google Cloud. Um, Amazon's the only one here in this picture, but the idea is that we have the ability to iterate quickly and provision infrastructure quickly. And the way that we manage stuff is with a tool called Terraform. So this is a tool from the HashiCorp suite, um, and it allows you to basically declaratively define resources and infrastructure that you want to be provisioned in Amazon. It lets us track it, it lets us build out this infrastructure as code in the way that we build out any other piece of software. Additionally, there's some tools that we use like Vault um, for secret management, secret engine, um, encryption at rest, um, as well as console for service discovery and its key value store functionalities. You have the ability to create semaphores, there's like locking features. And uh, Packer is another tool, maybe not, not so uh, popular or spoken about all the time, but it allows you to basically create these machine images that you can provision a virtual machine from. And you can you know, build them locally or in the cloud or VMware and so forth. Real Quick, I wanted to provide some insight on, into how we do project management. So we were on uh, GitHub Enterprise, GHG before, migrated recently to GitLab. So we leverage GitLab for source code management and um, we leverage trunk-based development with Git. So if you're not familiar with trunk-based development, quick Google search will show you what that means. Um, but essentially we have a mainline uh, master or the mainline branch that's always functional. And every time we want to uh, create or add any features, we create a feature branch. And what we do is the feature branch, the name of the feature branch has the developer's initials and the corresponding issue that it solves. So there's a, there's a, a, a tightly coupled relationship between the issues and the tracking board and the code that's being developed in the feature branch. So when that 
feature branch is merged, that issue is, is moved to close, and there's, there's high transparency in what we're doing. The changes to the code base correspond with changes to the, uh, the issues that we're working on. So that, that's why we use GitLab issue tracking. So um, we leverage the, the there's like um, tracking board, issue tracking boards that exist inside of a, a repo, and you can create like an amount of um, task boards. That's kind of cool. And uh, if you're interested in more about Agile and kind of like some other principles that we practice internally, check out um, Lean Production Methods. So if you're interested in um, just to be inspired with some methods of like how you can organize work streams, um, organize work, uh, that's something that has inspired us to, uh, to change the way that we build things. So um, here's a list of some resources and concepts that uh, inspired me to create this content. So if you have any other uh, questions, feel free to contact us. And if you want more information and content, check out our DevOps Wire. Um, and also, thanks so much for watching. So if you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe um, on our YouTube channel. But without Without anything else, um, thanks so much for listening. Thank you.